Melissa to you in South Africa. Tell us where you are. Hi, Jessica. Greetings from Cape Town, South Africa. Wonderful. It's in the middle of winter here. It's, it's in the middle of winter? We are not believe it because we have the most fantastic weather today. I call it a champagne day. Oh, <laughs> just wonderful. Gorgeous blue skies and just fabulous, yeah. And greetings to you from Eugene, Oregon, the Willamette Valley. We are in the middle of, this is starting summer here, so starting to be warm and sunny and, and all kinds of things. The rainy season is over. So, so we'll just go ahead and start. So the Time to Wine broadcast is live, a live broadcast on the second and fourth Monday of the month at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And of course, I post every time zone in the world because we have a very worldly uh, broadcast. The live stream is the first and third Monday of the month at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And Melissa Sutherland is here from Cape Town, South Africa, and she's talking about her, her business. She's a tour operator, founder, chief travel curator of Vindigo Travel, a luxury inbound tour operating based in Cape Town. So we're going to talk a little bit about her work history, COVID, her tours, South Africa, and just get into that there. So Melissa, do you want to talk a little bit about your work history? Cool. Well, thanks so much, first of all, Jessica, just for the opportunity. It's just really great. And I mean, I think one thing that COVID has done is it's made us realize just how small the world is. And, um, <laughs> and we actually are connecting in ways which we, we didn't beforehand. And um, so I really value the opportunity just to, to yeah, share a little bit of, of, of the journey of Indigo Travel. And obviously in, in luxury tourism business has been highly affected because of, of, of what's happened uh, with the global pandemic. But yeah, just a little bit of background. I started out, um, my first job was actually working on the American desk of um, at the South African Department of International Affairs. And it was just when Nelson Mandela had been freed from prison. And um, it was an extraordinary time to be involved in being a South African diplomat. I then got sent to New York, where I was a vice consul for political and cultural affairs, putting together itineraries for visiting dignitaries and yeah, just really showcasing um, South Africa and introducing South Africa to an American audience. Lived in New York six and a half years, absolutely loved it. Two children born there. Um, and yeah, then my husband's job actually took us to Sydney and I got involved in publishing and worked again for an American company, um, McGraw-Hill Educational Publishers. And that was actually a wonderful way to see Australia because I was going around calling on professors like yourself, <laughs> trying to sell them textbooks. And must say, now that I'm in, in, in travel, um, I, 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 in, in a way, I, I enjoy more, I must say, um, selling luxury um, travel packages than textbooks. I can actually say that. And yeah, I came back to South Africa 15 years ago and um, started Vindigo Travel as um, as a you know, a business. Um, yeah, as I said, as you said, it's an inbound luxury tour operator. So I, I'm a connector. I love connecting people and opportunities, and um, also just showcasing the best of South Africa. And um, we are blessed. We have the most extraordinary uh, country and product here. So, yeah. I'm a connector. I'm a connector as well, as you may know. I seem to do this yes. on, on social media every day. So, okay, let's yeah. talk a little bit about South Africa during COVID and prohibition. We've had significant changes in the world and I th that have affected all of us. By the way, uh, Eugene, Oregon is, we, it, it's kind of scary, but we are now in very low risk and we have been told we're starting concerts and we are, uh -huh starting church services right now we've been told we can get rid of our mask so it's it's the scary part of that is every time that happens we seem to backlash dramatically to where we're in total social isolation again but right now things have we have most of us have two vaccines and we're able to start interacting with crowds yeah. and concerts and yeah. um, athletics yeah. again. So so anyway, that would be in tours. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, look, South Africa is open for for anyone who wants to visit South Africa. It's welcome as long as they've got a neg- either be vaccinated or have a negative PCR test. It's actually been a, f- a fabulous place to be during lockdown, in as much as uh, you can get onto the beaches and um, walk and hike and um, be in the outdoors and stuff. But the reality is, is that we are in our third wave and. Um, the government has handled it pretty well um, right from the beginning. We were very strict with our lockdown. In fact, last year we were in lockdown at level five. Um, I think when I turned 50, which was uh, exactly a year ago in June, and, and, be, and having to be indoors, and obviously there was no way that alcohol was banned. Um, because unfortunately there's a correlation between people drinking and then not social distancing. And um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, we unfortunately, what can I say? We're all speaking the same language in terms of social distancing and whether we wear our masks or not. And in a way it's bringing the world together. Um, Now we are in our third wave and um, people are being continually reminded to social distance, wear their masks, there are protocols in place. In terms of vaccinations, um, there's been a bit of a slow rollout, um, but all our healthcare um, people are vaccinated, over 60s are able to get vaccinated now, and we're confident that um, we are all going to be able to go and get our jabs soon. And, um, yeah, we're open for business. Um, it's very slow, and I think that's just the reality as the world starts opening up. And yeah, but in terms of prohibition, you call it. We call it. Um, what do we call? It? We don't call it prohibition. It's just the alcohol ban. And um, alcohol ban. Okay. The alcohol ban, and at the moment we're at level three, and so what that means is that alcohol is available to purchase. Um, off-site from Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., I think it is, and then on-site consumption is allowed at restaurants, and then which is, and what's most important is that all the wine farms can be open, and one of the things that's really, because we are talking a sort of some wine focus here, is that it's actually, um, it's actually brought the consumer closer to the wine farms, because the wine farms have been selling directly to the consumer and um, so in a way uh, we've also all realized how much we love our wine and um and wanting to support the industry so yeah and i think i was talking to i was talking to someone in south africa and i've got to think of who it was but part of the discussion was there was a lot of under the table uh, operations having to happen because they weren't able to sell wine. So a lot of people were selling uh, coffee with a receipt that said coffee. And, the, oh, oh, and, oh, and there, oh, were, there were a lot of restrictions there. And then there was also quite a few, there were grocery stores that were selling the pineapple alcohol or, or yes, having things yes. available for pineapple. Al- what, what is that called? The pineapple. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I mean, but they were putting uh, ingredients together in the store. Yeah, they were making some kind of concoction. I think mean, people must have been pretty desperate. Um, but uh, there was actually a lot of bootlegging. And but I think there was also a sense that, you know, the wine industry employs a lot of people. And um, the government couldn't just randomly uh, close down um, that revenue source when there was such a dire need for people to remain employed. And um, so, yeah, it's been a bit of a balancing act. And but I think now the the government has also realised there's been this whole um, you know lives versus livelihoods debate. Um, but recognising you can't just close down a sector, especially tourism, um, where it's just so reliant as well on on you know if restaurants can't sell alcohol, then I mean their margins are so low anyway. You know, but. Um, I think we're all learning. We're all learning going through these different waves. And um, yeah, so. So tell us a little about tour. Clearly, we've, we've all uh, had to shift our work during this because it's affected. I think what's so amazing to me is how many industries were affected. It, things, I, I had an airline pilot 
talked to me the other day and the airline pilots were sitting at home. And, and so there were all kinds of industries affected. And I had another gentleman come in. He worked in a restaurant and he also worked at the gym. The restaurants and the gyms were closed. So he was sitting at home. So talk a little bit about your tours, what you have available, how you've had to shift during this unprecedented sci-fi movie that we're in. <laughs> I know. That's crazy, isn't it? It's, it's definitely mean, I a think, book. I think I'm really sick of the word unprecedented. Yes. <laughs> and, also, and also the word pivot, you know, how we all pivoted our businesses and stuff. Yes, how, <laughs> how have we had to pivot? <laughs> We've had to pivot, yeah. Look, I mean, I think um, the, 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 the – well, speaking for Bendigo Travel, we are a luxury inbound to operator. So most of our clients are well heels, Americans, Europeans, uh, Brits, and suddenly that market dried up overnight. And so then we had to pivot to local luxury and realize actually that we have got quite a few local people who normally this time of the year would be traveling in Europe or America or wherever and suddenly realize that they can't leave the country because of the restrictions. And so they've looked around and thought, hang on, <laughs> there's this amazing product that people come from all over the world to experience. Why are we not um, taking, making the most of this opportunity? So South Africans are exploring their own backyard. And I think that's a trend that's happening globally in terms of domestic tourism. Um, also, I think it's been a wake-up call to the luxury lodges um, when they realize that they, in a way, outpriced themselves from the local market. And so now they're offering the most incredible specials. So it has actually never been a better time if you are a South African to visit the bush. And, um, and a lot of people, it's a once-in-a-lifetime sort of bucket list thing to go on safari. And a lot of South Africans actually would, which was too expensive for them. So I'm actually very uh, fortunate is that, I mean, I'm looking at a really strong July, August, which is when our school holidays are, and it's the best time to visit the bush because it's dry. And so all the animals come to the water holes. And um, I'm actually really excited to be able to introduce, to be introducing locals to their own country because then they become ambassadors for that product to when they next do travel overseas. And, and they're actually, I mean, I'm finding that, you know, people who are going to these places are coming back and saying, I didn't even realize we had the most extraordinary, you know, these five star lodges and stuff. So, so yeah, so that's been a, a positive in that sense. Yeah. Okay. So, so what are some of your, during COVID, some of your mental health tips that we've all done a variety of different coping techniques <laughs> no, and, jessica, and your hobbies we, we, yeah jessica we 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 i must say when when covid first struck uh it felt like a body blow especially you know if you're involved in tourism and like now what you know and we just didn't know how long it was going to last although i must say i sort of had a sense that it wasn't going to be a, a quick fix thing um, and so I think I, I found it so important to to keep fit, actually. And um, just um, I started running again, and that's was that's been invaluable just to to be able to do that. There's the most extraordinary online yoga and Pilates, and um, so I think that's been useful. Um, yeah, I also found it's important to be able to switch off because we're all working from home. So the blurs and the distinctions of when do you actually switch off. And for me, what I've found is it's important to have like a digital detox. And I think I'm, I'm stealing that expression from Ariana Huffing Huffington in her, in her book Thrive. But actually turning off my phone between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. So actually for 12 hours. Um, and yeah, just really being being much more mindful um, of how what one's eating. I think it's really given us uh, a chance to pause and um, and yeah, and also really connect with family. And I say I, I love doing puzzles. So for me, um, that's a way for me to also just completely zone out. And often I feel that when I'm putting together tours, and all of our tours are privately curated, it feels like putting a puzzle together. 
and um, so so. And then I've also started. I think it's funny enough. People have gone back to the old craft. I mean, I find myself. I was knitting in front of Netflix, and um, actually knitting baby um, blankets for the underprivileged. Um, babies and just instead of just mindlessly watching a series actually using the time productively so yeah and also i also paint so for me um that's just a wonderful zone art as well to be able to to, to do that yeah it's so important that you know no one else is going to look after you you have to look after you and i think as women um and mothers particularly although my children are now a bit older um, we're giving, giving, giving all the time, and it's so important to um, to replenish, you know, fill the well. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think, and when this started, that's the first thing I did was when when things feel really out of control, which they did at that juncture, where we were not supposed to talk be out in public at all or, or be out at the grocery store and all those kind of things. I started heavily exercising too. So yeah. I, I started at the gym, but the gym has been, is up, you know, it's been really high on the dangerous list as a 10. Exactly. So yeah. I started at the gym and the gym would open and close, but I started doing every day. I walk about 25,000 steps a day. So I do ah, a lot of yeah. walking. Have you got a Fitbit? I've got, <laughs> yes, I've got my, I've got my Fitbit on. And then yeah. I started doing, I was talking to um, Mattia yesterday. I started meditating during this process, which has been very helpful. And then all of our work is online. So I've been sitting here, as you know, <laughs> <laughs> doing this, doing this uh, about 50 or 60 hours a week. So, yeah. okay, so this is your mental health tip. So let's talk a little bit about, so did we talk about the silver linings? So what do you think some of the silver linings of this yeah, work? So, I, so say, I think I mean, some I, of the, your mental health tips are in yeah, exercising but, or silver linings. Yeah, I mean, I think silver linings as well, um, just in terms of, of, of productivity around, you know, we participate in we we participated in in some some virtual um, trade shows, which like ITB Berlin, which is the biggest sort of um, trade show for our industry. And normally it would be too expensive to go there, but there there was a virtual platform that you were able to participate in as an equal in front of a computer, and we found it incredibly valuable in terms of networking. Um, and actually being more productive in terms of setting up meetings for these trade shows. And I actually think the silver lining is that these trade shows, they'll continue to have a hybrid. Yes, it's wonderful to meet in person, but actually you can get a lot of work done um, before you go and meet in person. So I think that's a silver lining. Um, I also found I met some wonderful people who I wouldn't normally have met. Um, I have a, a weekly... German conversation class with a, a, a woman who is now teaching in Stuttgart um, and she, we speak German together. She used to be a tour guide in Cape Town, moved back to Germany. So it's giving me an opportunity to upskill for keeping my German fluent. And we've never met in person, but we have plans, God willing, that we will be drinking wine together in Europe or South Africa down the line. And yeah, so I think it's also in a way what COVID's done is it's, it's thrown out all the rules and actually anything is possible. And I think that's very, very liberating. Um, I think also for, for this whole notion of flexible work and particularly, I say women again, but um, you know, you can work from home and you can be productive and people are not going to rush back into the office and rush back into the traffic. And so it almost feels like a God said, pause, stop. You know, we were so, we just took travel for granted. And I think one of the things now is realizing that travel is a gift. You know, there was a wonderful quote by Eric Wiener, I think his name is from National Geographic, in an article he wrote saying, you know, travel is food for the soil. Right now, we're between courses. And we're looking at what we ate in our first course and, and deciding where we're going to go next, you know. And it's really given people, um, I think it's changed, it's going to change how people travel in a positive way. That I think when they do travel, they're going to be much more conscious of where they're going. They might go for longer. I think um, 
yeah, they want to travel and their families um, yeah, be more intentional. So. Okay. So let's talk. We I, Those of us that are big international travelers, and then you just mentioned this a, a few minutes ago, have quite a few culture shock stories. So <laughs> you wanted to talk a little, little bit about people from the United States visiting South Africa. And then <laughs> I, I've been to South America, Italy, Australia, et cetera. So I have qu- yeah. plenty yeah. of culture shock <laughs> stories as well. Look, I think one of the things is, is gets lost in translation. And, and, you know, in South Africa, we've got 11 official languages. And um, one of the official languages is Afrikaans, which derives from, from the Dutch language. So I was with a bunch of American clients, and uh, we were down in Simon's Town, this little fishing village. And um, one of them needed to have a comfort break. And so they asked me, why does it say open bear toilet? <laughs> <laughs> And it it says open bare toilet, but actually it's the Afrikaans word for public, which is open bare. So open bare means public toilet, but it's actually spelled open bare toilet. I I had never read it as open bare, especially with a toilet. (laughs) Because it's just normal. Why does it say open bare? And I said, well, does it? But it's public in Afrikaans, open bar. So for me, that was that was quite funny. And, and it's funny like, within your own culture, you can't see these things until someone else asks you. Yes, exactly, exactly. And look, I think for people who've never visited Africa, in some ways, South Africa really kind of um, it sort of messes a little bit with their mind because they've got this impression of what Africa is like from what they've seen on National Geographic and whatever, and suddenly they arrive in Cape Town, for example, which is a very sophisticated city, or Johannesburg, which is like the New York of, of, of South Africa. And it's almost, especially for Cape, people say it's, it's almost there's a disappointment it's not African enough. You know, we've got a castle dating back from the 1600s. Um, we've got a lot of uh, colonial architecture and stuff. But that's just on the surface. Um, and um, what I find, what I love is when I... When um, with clients, often it's their first time to South Africa, and with, they know they're only going to be there for three days in Cape Town, and they're already talking about when they come back. And uh, so, so yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, it's, it's South Africa is, see, you know, does get under people's skin, and, and often people, people, you know, come back. I mean, I was paid to sell South Africa when I was working as a diplomat in New York. And I mean, I could say, oh, it's wonderful, oh, it's fantastic, but it was an American coming back with an American accent saying, you know what, it's great, and it's best form of marketing, word of mouth from a trusted source. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, it's, I, I can't think off the top of my head about some other examples, but, um, but, but yeah. I told um, Mattia yesterday, I was in Italy, I was in Bassano del Grappa, and I was in a parking lot. So in the United States, so if, let's say if you're at the airport, and you're leaving the parking lot, and you have to pay, there is a some a, a, an attendant there, or there is a, a place to put your credit card, and then you get a ticket and you leave. In this particular situation, there was a sign in Italian indicating that, and I don't even know if there was a sign. I was supposed to go across the street somewhere and purchase a ticket. However, I'm not sure there was a sign. I'm not sure there was anything that indicated I needed to purchase this ticket. So I'm leaving the parking lot and I'm in a queue of about 12 Italian cars. So I get close enough to see that there's nowhere to pay. And I'm not really sure how I'm supposed to get out of this parking lot. So I very eloquently had to get out of the car and do my best to speak Italian to say, Oh, pardon me. (laughs) I need to get out of this queue. I'm not, (laughs) I'm not, I don't have a ticket. So, um, so the car's all backed up. (laughs) I could get out and I'm sure there was a stupid American woman in there somewhere. But anyway, uh, then I found that the ticket across the street was supposed to go 
So, so my kinds of things, <laughs> my, I've had lots of culture shock stories in a variety of countries. There's also a story I have. There is a, I can't think of the hand gesture at the moment. There's a hand gesture in Italy that means everything's good. And so I was continually making this just gesture in Brazil. This same gesture is something such as a middle finger in the United States. <laughs> And so I was doing this, my husband's from Brazil. So I was doing this to my mother-in-law. He was trying to understand why I was giving her obscene finger gestures. So, <laughs> so, okay. so let's talk about a little bit about how do you market your business using social media? Well, I must say I love Instagram. And I think a picture tells a thousand words. And I'm a very visual person. So I find that Instagram is very effective. Um, I'm on Twitter and Facebook. And obviously, I've got a website. Um, yeah, I think nowadays, it's actually so important to be on those different platforms with different audiences, that, um, especially with millennials. Um, you know, that's, I mean, a lot of, you know, they. <laughs> And you know, we, we do some work with influencers, and you know, it is really all about um, that Instagram moment, you know. So, and they're reaching you know huge audiences and stuff. And I think there's real, real power in that. Um, that although quite a few of my clients are sort of, um, I don't want to say they're older, um, but Facebook they'd be more comfortable with. But um, but yeah, so I think it's it's we're actually very blessed to have these amazing tools to to market um, businesses with um, as long as you've got uh, good wi-fi and look at us now what i realize as well is going forward um, when i'm going to be uh, speaking with consultants i mean as a tour consultant my clients are going to want to see me online like we're chatting here you know it's not a question of sending an email um, yes, we're on TripAdvisor. Yes, we, um, you know, we, 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 we're a real business. We're part of, um, you know, the, the well-regarded SASA, the Southern African Tourism Services Association. But people want to, you know, people want to see you as well um, through, through working with, you know, these kinds of platforms. I mean, what we also, and I'm pivoting, I'm not pivoting, I'm just moving the conversation a little bit in terms of, you know, all of our itineraries are digital. There's a this fabulous South African company called Wet. W E T U, which helps tour operators like myself and around the world sell tours better by creating all the visuals, um, and it's really been such a fabulous tool for us to to work with. Um, yeah, so I think social media you can't get away from it. I mean, it's, um, sometimes you, you know, and, and also I mean I'm passionate about what I do, so it does integrate into my life. Um, I think sometimes you know my friends and family get a bit jealous and they think. You know, I'm living this life of Riley, and I have to explain to them actually, this is work, you know. And I'm promoting places, I'm connecting with people to, I'm telling them what's out there because I'm very fortunate to be on the coal face of seeing, seeing what's out there. And that ties in as well with the tours that we put together because, especially in a post COVID world, um, you know, the restaurant that you heard about, which you thought you had to book to eat because some people travel through the lens of food. It doesn't exist anymore. It didn't survive COVID. So that's where you have to really work with someone on the ground who really knows what, what the, the, the state of play is. You know, I mean, I've got an American client in town at the moment who wanted to go to um, Robben Island. Now, at the moment, they're only running one tour a day at 11 o'clock and not every day to Robben Island. So, you know, unless you, you knew that or somebody in the know like, like Vindigo Travel could tell you that, you may come all the way to South Africa, realize you're there on the day when that tour doesn't run kind of thing. Um, so in this post-COVID world, I think it is so important to be working and especially, you know, um, I mean, all of our tours are private. They're um, curated. And when I, you know, this whole tagline of curated travel, what does curate mean? It actually means to choose. And it's choosing out of knowing what's out there and very specifically choosing and matching to the client um, because there is so much um, that is that you can go and see and do in South Africa. How do you choose? Okay. And so, and then also, yes, knowing when to come and having someone to contact. So what do you post on social media? Do you post 
your tours or what what are you posting on a daily basis or how do you know what to post because, because none of our tours are um i mean if you go onto my website for example there'll be a journeys tab and it'll give you some examples but actually that's really just to start a conversation um so i want to wake people's interests so for i know for example you know, when people think of Africa, they don't necessarily think of, of wine, they don't think of art, they think of safari. And I mean, a safari actually means a journey. And, um, you know, I have a little play on the hashtag wine safari, hashtag urban art safari. But actually, you know, I, mostly when um, people come and a lot of our clients, they'll be like a week in the Cape and they'll see the vineyards and then they'll go up the garden route. And they'll see Table Mountain and Robin Island and the big six we call it so, um, Cape Point and the Kirstenbosch Botanical Gardens and the Constantia Winelands and the Penguins and Boulders Beach. And then they'll want to go and see the big five, which is up on when they go on safari. And that's um, the various options for safari, some places where you don't have to take anti malaria tablets, like in the Eastern Cape or the Dikwe, or other places where you do have to take malaria ta anti malaria tablets. But, um, you know, the big five, you get to see lion and rhino and elephant and buffalo and leopard, you know. So that becomes a, you know, a safari, it's expensive, but it is a magical, magical. Um, experience which hopefully more people will feel that bucket list travel you know if not now then when you know yes i i, uh, love I, I am tomorrow. i am very definitely hoping well i've missed the concerts actually not eating out has been interesting because i I've been cooking so much at home mm. but it was interesting you know when you're cooking at home everything is so seems so much nicer then you go out to eat again and it seems like there's so much salt and so much artificial <laughs> flavoring so i found i like actually in and spending uh 45 dollars eating out when you go oh my gosh i can buy three weeks worth of groceries for 45 dollars it was kind of an eye-opening that was kind of a silver mm. lining and eye-opening situation and yeah. i also <clears throat> lost a lot of weight during covid which uh, many people did not do but, but it's I, funny because some people put on weight <laughs> some people put on some weight people lost yeah some i lost i lost a, about 13 pounds so i've oh, lost a lot of weight back here still great. still going down so now so in closing so we talked a little bit about south africa which i want to i want to talk to you more about south africa but we're at about 30 minutes here so we should probably stop so why don't you tell people I think you did this a little bit, but how to find you, you have a website, yeah. you have social media pages. So tell them how yeah. they can reach out to you and how yeah. to find you. Look, I think the best way is through our website. So it's www.vindigo. Think of indigo, the color with a V in front of it for, you know, vindigotravel.com. So www.vindigotravel.com. We have on that a contact us page. Um, which you can then um, send us um, what you're looking for, and then we'll happily engage with you, do a Skype call or a Zoom. I mean, it's funny how we all never heard of Zoom before COVID, and now we're all actually Zooming and we're doing, what are we doing here? Are we doing something? Um, this is a, a nice platform as well. <laughs> I haven't used this platform before. But, um, yeah, we'd love to chat and love to, to really um, assist because, you know what your budget is and um, you know what your time is. I mean, South Africa is a long haul destination. Having lived in the States, I understand that. Um, so you want to make sure that your holiday counts. And that's where you, it really is valuable to work with a professional who can um, make sure that, yeah, you, you get to see what you want to see um, within your budget and, um, and feel that, that you're well looked after. And we'd love to help. Yeah. So what what sort of expense are we looking at here for, you know, I know, I know the airfare is less expensive right now, but traditionally, what is the airfare from the United States to South Africa? And what sort of expense are we looking for on the tour? And I know that depends on what you're doing and the length of time. Everything is, everything is so dependent in terms of you know, whether it's a private, just you, just you or a solo traveler or a couple or a family, because I mean, I, I, it would be difficult to to be able to say it's that much or, or that much, but um, 
But I mean, for example, you know, one of the ladies I'm, I'm working with at the moment, she said, listen, this is my budget. And so I said, well, let's do two days of private touring um, as opposed to a week of private touring. And, and actually just giving guidance that you actually can do things by yourself if you want to go up Table Mountain. It's perfectly safe. You know, there's a red hop on, hop off bus. You know, but then if you want a few days of, of bespoke wine country and meeting the winemaker and having special barrel tastings and having, um, you know, bookings made at top restaurants, well, then that's when you use somebody like um, us with, with Vindigo. But you can actually actually mix and match. And I think what? specifically... <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish. You can go ahead. I was just saying, you know, specifically with safari, because the the distances are so big, if you are flying up from Cape Town to go on safari in Puga, you really need to work with somebody who knows what they're talking about in terms of how long it's going to take you to get to the places because you don't want to spend a huge amount of money. And I mean, you're talking $1,000 a night per person to go on safari at, at some of the lodges. And then to find out that actually it's it's taking you eight hours to get there. You you know you have one day and then you have to leave again. So you really want to to, to work with, with with professionals who who know what the situation is on the ground. Yeah. And then just just quickly, what's the exchange rate from the U.S. dollar to the South African? Is it, is it, is it called the dollar? Is it the dollar? That's the uh, South African rand. Rand. And okay. And I think we've had the RAND for 60 years now. <laughs> but um, the RAND dollar exchange rate is very favorable towards Americans. At the moment, it's about 14 RAND to $1. Now, when we left so that, when we left the States, it was three and a half RAND to, to the dollar. I mean, that was in 2000 and, uh, 2001. Yeah. But still. I mean, it's very favorable for Americans to travel to South Africa. Yeah. Oh, that sounds wonderful. I'd love to. I'd love to visit South Africa. So, okay. So, Time to Wine broadcast. We'll talk a little bit about that really quickly. Is featured on quite a few different platforms. It's featured on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It is on LinkedIn as well as Pinterest, and it is also. I think that's. I'm trying to think of anything else that I'm on it. I'm on everything. So uh, people are asking for Clubhouse. People are asking for Instagram broadcast. So I'm back here in my free time doing everything I can to pick up all of these different things on the uh, different social media channels that are coming in. So Time to One broadcast is on the second and fourth Monday of the month at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. The live stream is on the first and third Monday uh, excuse me, first and third Friday of the month at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we're going to close today. Also, if you'd like to see more of these interviews, I'm starting to film one about once a week. Uh, we may, I'm doing it twice a month, but it may go to a weekly endeavor. Hit subscribe and follow us on YouTube because I'll be posting these on a very regular basis and on a variety of social media channels. And let's Tell Melissa, thank you so much. I appreciate you. And I can't wait to work with you more and see South Africa. And then also, as mentioned, I have had prior to COVID, nine universities ask me if I could take students to, to a variety of countries. And the University of Washington said, can I take students to South Africa? So we'll talk a little well, bit about we, that later. We would love to help. We would love to help. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. You too. Bye. -bye. <laughs>